your horse racing with daily racing rewards formulated. Now free for DRF Bets members. Sign up to get the best bonus of racing with a $250 deposit match, plus a $10 free bet and free formulated past performances. Go to drf.com slash bet to play like a pro today. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the DRF Preakness Webinar 2023. I'm Dan Ullman, and I'm very pleased to be working today with one of the best in the business, David Aragon. And not only does he make one of the best morning lines in the country for the New York Racing Association, he is the ace New York handicapper for Timeform US. And if you're not following his podcasts on DRF TV, on the Daily Racing Forum YouTube channel, you're missing out because David and Craig Milkowski do a fantastic job twice a week recapping the prior week's races and handicapping the upcoming big ones. It's in-depth analysis you don't want to miss. David, looking forward to doing this with you today. Oh, as am I. You know that we don't get to work uh, together too much, but I really enjoy all the content that you put together with Mike Beer. I know you've been filming a lot of stakes previews around all of these races over the weekend at Pimlico. Uh, so I've been following that. I'm looking forward to discussing some preakness with you. Well, we thank everybody for joining us on the webinar today. What we're going to talk about, of course, is the Preakness Stakes featuring Mage as he hopes to head on to Belmont in three weeks' time and look for the Triple Crown. We'll then talk a little bit about the Pick 5 sequence with ends in the Preakness. Maybe talk about a couple of interesting horses on the card, and then we'll get to your question. So let's start things off with the Preakness. Here's the field, race number 13, of course, three-year-olds, mile and three-sixteenths, $1.5 million. The story of the race is Mage. And to me, David, what was most important about his victory in the Kentucky Derby, say what you want about the quality of the field, was that he was able to overcome his inexperience. He didn't break well. Horses that are so lightly raced like that, how many times have we seen it in the Derby? They just give it up right away. He traveled like a winner every step, and he showed push-button acceleration. No, I mean, hindsight's always twenty twenty in this game, but I remember looking back and thinking, oh, well, I had thought that Mage ran the best race in the Florida Derby. He had shown the talent to win a race like the Kentucky Derby, and like so many handicappers, I just let it get in my head that lightly raced horses like this so often would progress in the Kentucky Derby, but Mage was able to buck that trend, and maybe that just speaks to the way the industry is changing over the past uh, decade or so, that it made, a horse like Mage was able to be successful in the Derby, but uh, he really showed the mental and physical attributes to be able to overcome that slow start, work out the trip. Uh, Javier Castellano rode him with a ton of confidence that day, and he had a right to be confident. This horse really delivered on the day, did get a favorable pace set up, but he still ran a 105 buyer, which makes him a significant standout in this race. And as has been well reported, he is the only horse running back out of the Kentucky Derby. And this freak is something that we haven't really seen uh, since the traditional uh, two-week, three-week triple crown schedule has been set up. You're in that 105 buyer, as you mentioned. You also mentioned he got a wonderful pace scenario. They were rolling right along in the early part of the race. They won't be going as fast, I don't think, in the early part of the Preakness, but I'm not sure I want to pigeonhole this horse just yet as a true one-run closer. As you look at his past performances, he did show speed in his career debut going seven-eighths of a mile. It's just been his gate woes that have been his own worst enemy in his subsequent three starts. Yeah, Mage is a very handy horse. Uh, I know that his running lines on paper make him look like a deep closer, but as you were saying, he does have plenty of natural speed. And I think the great thing about Mage is that after that slow break, he's right in the bridle and he's ready for you. Not getting keen or rank, but Javier Castellano can push the button whenever he wants. And I think he elected to wait to push the button in the Kentucky Derby, which proved to be the right move. Uh, Luis Saez, uh, you know, unleashed the trigger a little earlier in the Florida Derby when he made that half mile run for home. But I think in this smaller Preakness field, I wouldn't be so worried, even if Mage is last heading, you know, into that first eighth of a mile, that he can move whenever he wants to. And maybe if this field is more compact, uh, he might have to exert less energy to get into contention. So, yes, it's a negative that he's a slow starter, but I don't view him in the same way that I would, let's say, a Tappan Trice, who that was the big worry about him in the Kentucky Derby, and he didn't possess that natural early speed. I think that's an excellent point. And again, you talked about his push button acceleration. I think 
of the other major contenders in this race, they're more grinding types, horses that might want a little bit of distance and certainly a little bit of help up front. This horse really has that sort of move, that burst of speed that you want to see, and that might simply make all of the difference. He's obviously the horse to beat. Let's talk about a horse that is going to be one of the wise guy horses in this year's Preakness. It's the second choice on the morning line, and it's first mission. In first mission, talk about lightly raced. This will only be his fourth lifetime start. I think you learned a lot of lessons in the Lexington last time out, shooting on through along the inside, being placed in a little bit tight and gamely gutting it out. I didn't like that he was a little bit late to change leads in that race. And I also don't really love the field he beat. I know Disarm came back to run very well in the Kentucky Derby. While Arabian Lion's going to be a big favorite earlier on the Saturday card in the Sir Barton, he's far from man of war. Yes, uh, I would agree with all of that. Uh, the Lexington, for me, came back a surprisingly fast race, and I do want to respect the speed figure. And as you said, Disarm certainly confirmed it, and then some, in the Kentucky Derby. So there's no denying that First Mission is a talented horse, and you know I wouldn't put too much stock in the fact that his speed figure dipped a little bit when he broke his maiden at the fairgrounds. I mean, he was just in a canter to win that race against overmatched competition. Uh, he's shown talent right from the start. He's got that handy running style, but he is more of a grinding type like you were saying doesn't have that big turn of foot and you can even see in the lexington where arabian lion who is a much handier sort of horse was able to put some distance between himself and first mission on the far turn and louis Sayas really had to get into this horse to ask him to reach top gear once he did he wore down arabian lion but Arabian Lion's a little bit of a faint-hearted horse, so I don't know how much credit I want to give him for that. Um, feels like he's not going to be that appealing of a price, at least for me, in this Preakness, but I certainly recognize that he's one of the most likely winners. I, I think price has to be everyone's guide in every race, but especially in a race like this. And I'm kind of with you. I respect the horse's ability, but there's always the buzz about sort of the alternative to the Derby winner in the Preakness, and he might be the one this year. National Treasure is the third choice on the morning line. And this is a horse that really has just sort of been behind schedule for most of 2023. He showed some ability last year, finishing third behind the two best two-year-olds in the country, uh, Forte and Cave Rock in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. In the sham, he got into a little bit of trouble, but again, he had that sort of grinding ability where he couldn't hit a hole, I thought, at a pretty key uh, moment. Then he had a foot issue that forced him out of the San Felipe, and he was then forced to run in the Santa Anita Derby off a little bit of a layoff. How would you analyze his Santa Anita Derby overall. He was wide on the backstretch. He was steadied a little bit at the quarter pole when, again, there was a hole there and he just couldn't hit it in time. And then he sort of grinded on late. Yeah, it's sort of been twice in a row in those two prep races this year, where when the real running starts on the far turn, it's like he's caught off guard a little bit, loses position. Uh, to me, it wasn't trouble that I really want to upgrade him for. It's more of a concern that he couldn't keep up pace with those horses when uh, they started to push for home at about the three-eighths pole. But in both races, he was staying on across the wire, so maybe that gives some confidence that added ground will help him. To me, watching him, he doesn't really feel like a horse that's itching to pass other horses horses. So maybe if the plan today or on Saturday is to get really aggressive out of the gate with the blinkers going back on and send him to the front, he's the horse that can make better use of that grinding style by just trying to run everybody else off their feet. I still have never been his biggest fan and I wasn't really on the bandwagon heading into the Kentucky Derby. So I'm not, I'm trying to resist the temptation to revise my opinion now, just because this Preakness came up a little bit on the softer side. Uh, he's definitely one of the win candidates, but again, I wasn't viewing him as being enough price for me to get that interested in. I think you made a very good point about the potential tactics that John Velasquez is going to use from the inside post, maybe trying to get aggressive, realizing that the potential main pace setter in the race, Coffee with Chris, is a big long shot, an unlikely winner on paper, and that National Treasure might want to just simply take the race to him. Let's move on to our next contender in this race by odds order. We'll talk a little bit about Re a Blazing Sevens. And Blazing Sevens, of course, won the champagne as a two-year-old. His race in the Fountain of Youth was dreadful. He was ice cold on the tote board, I thought, in that race. And then he just didn't run at all. The Bluegrass was a little bit better behind Tappet Trice. Is the reason to like Blazing Sevens, though, the fact that Chad Brown has done this before? He's skipped the Derby. He's run the, the Preakness with a fresh horse. And he's done very well. 
Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people are sort of latching on to that uh, viewpoint that Chad Brown has just sort of figured out the keys to winning the Preakness. But he, he's a different sort of horse than early voting and cloud computing were. I mean, they were horses that came to hand very late. I think both of them even debuted uh, either in December or January. Uh, so, I mean, they were lightly raised horses who had this upward trajectory coming into the Preakness, whereas Blazing Sevens sort of achieved his peak form as a two-year-old. And now he's trying to get back there third start off the layoff as a three-year-old so maybe the form cycle will work for him once again like it did for the two prior chad brown winners but a, a, a different sort of horse that's trying to get back to his past glory um as far as his bluegrass trip goes i mean it was definitely a huge step forward to me he traveled really well in the middle of that race he was in the bridle moving up on the far turn like he was going to have a say in the outcome and then once i read ortiz really set him down in the stretch he just sort of flattened out and didn't finish off that race that says to me well one of two things either he wasn't quite fit enough or number two maybe he doesn't really want to go this far and a turn back in distance could be in order in the future after all he was the winner of the one turn champagne as a two-year-old so i have some questions about him and he's another one that i feel like just given the angles of the chad brown factor i don't know how big a price he's going to be either very good points, uh, especially about the flattening out in the bluegrass. I'm going to take it as that maybe he wasn't fit enough for that race, and Chad will have him ready in his third start of the form cycle. But if his running style is similar to Mage's, I'd much rather have Mage as a closer, even though obviously Mage will be a shorter price. Speaking of closers, now we'll move on to our next horse, and that is Red Route 1, who has zero early speed and is likely to be last in the early portion of this race. He got a great setup last time out when they dropped him in class. The pace was fast. The competition was to his liking. He ran them down and he's run well in several other starts. The rebel in the Southwest. It's just that he seems to always leave himself too much to do. Yeah, I think the big worry with Red Route 1 is that he's been most successful when he's gotten those fast-paced situations, and the races have sort of come back to him like it did in the Rebel, and like it did last time in that Bathhouse Row Stakes. Um, and he, re he will really finish when he gets that setup, but it just feels like in a race like this, where the pace is likely to be more on the moderate side, a smaller field, uh, if he drops as far back as he has been, if he's as sluggish in the early going, he just might not be able to make up the ground late because he's another horse that doesn't necessarily have that turn of foot. He tries to grind his way into the race from a long way out, and that might not be the right running style in the Preakness. I will say, whereas I have some questions about the form and the trajectories of a few other horses in here, I feel like Red Route 1 is going to show up and run his race, I just feel like it's much more likely to garner a minor award than the winning share. With his running style, he's always at the mercy of pace and trip, but I do agree with you. He's honest and he's going to run on at the end, and we've seen stranger things happen if they go guns blazing somehow in the early part of this race. You'll certainly hear from Red Route 1 late. Let's move on to perform. This horse was supplemented to this race for a whopping $150,000, and in his most recent start at Laurel, the Federico Tessio, he had to sort of weave his way through all sorts of traffic. I talked to Fergal Lynch after the race, and he said the horse just didn't seem to be taking him anywhere in the early part. And then once he got himself behind uh, the eventual beaten favorite down on the backstretch, he started to pick it up, and then he had to weave his way through. The pace was fast in this race. The pace setter, who I think is a good horse, 90% Bryn, was exhausted at the wire, but performed ever since being stretched out by the great Shug McGahey has put it all together. Yeah, I think there's no doubt that this horse is improving. Uh, even his maiden victory, two back at Tampa Bay Downs, might have been a stronger race than it really looks on paper. I mean, the second place finisher came back and improved by leaps and bounds in his next start, stretching out to a mile and a quarter at Churchill Downs. Uh, as far as the Federico Tessio goes, I know that it's not been the most productive Preakness prep in the past. And... This year's race, I mean, it didn't earn a particularly fast speed figure. It was the kind of race that sort of was what I call an accordion race where it all came together at the end. I mean, the field was stretched out around the far turn. The leaders just came back to the field. I think first through eighth were separated by four lengths in the race. So to me, that's often a race that I just think overall isn't the strongest. And yes, perform did have to alter course multiple times in the last three eighths of the race, but he was also saving all the ground. He made the last move in a race that was falling apart. So I think it's a little bit of an optical illusion. I won't be surprised when he improves again. I'm just not sure it's going to be enough.
He's going to have to really improve against this much tougher field. Mage, of course, beat him in his seasonal debut when Mage was making only his career debut and they were traveling seven-eighths of a mile. Let's move on to our next contender. This is Coffee with Chris. And listen, it's hard not to root for horses like this. A $2,000 yearling purchase, a horse that's been running and claiming races but shows up each and every time. Distance has always been the question for this horse since day one. I think he surprised his connection somewhat when he won the Miracle Wood going a one-turn mile, when the runner-up Prince of Jericho was floated into the parking lot turning for home, but he still showed a lot of determination to win, considering the long stretch at Laurel. And then in the private terms, I think he, again, outran expectations when finishing second, even though he was the favorite. Uh, in the Tessio, he was part of that very fast pace, and he tired. Uh, he'll likely be a pace presence here. Uh, from a class standpoint, certainly from a distance standpoint, uh, there are major obstacles here. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the trips in the Tessio, I actually think Coffee with Chris had a more difficult time of it than Perform did, which I know is counter to the general narrative about that race. I just wonder if I can really apply that opinion to this Preakness, because it just feels like it might not be the right race for him. And I get why they're taking a shot. Uh, I probably would have found him more appealing in a race like the Sir Barton on this undercard, uh, but they decided to take a shot here. And uh, He will be part of the pace. I do wonder if the concerns about the distance that the connections surely have with this horse will maybe make them a little less intent on being super aggressive from the start, which might work in the favor of a horse like National Treasure. Uh, but uh, he's got some talent, just not for the right race. Yeah, I think maybe a turn back will be in order for him and maybe we'll see him, maybe not in the top, top races, but in races going seven eighths of a mile to a mile, a mile and a sixteenth. And he'll have a pretty good year if he stays sound. And the longest shot on the board in this year's Preakness is the number two Chase the Chaos. Now he's here because he won a win and you're in over a tapita service. That was the El Camino Real Derby three starts back. Unfortunately for Chase the Chaos, he hasn't run well in his two subsequent starts, one of them the San Felipe on dirt. Uh, he's a horse that's very hard to recommend on paper. Yeah, he's the real outsider in this field. Uh, he's 50 to 1 on the track morning line. And if they bet this Preakness like they've been betting the recent Triple Crown races, he could be less than half of that. I mean, it just seems like horses don't go off at these huge prices in the Triple Crown races. And he deserves to be a huge price in this race. He just doesn't have the form to really compete at this level. Now the most important part, how do you bet the Preakness? Mage seems like the best horse. He's probably going to go off around even money or so at post time, maybe slightly higher. Uh, is he the kind of horse that you single in the pick five and try to find prices elsewhere? Are you going to try to key him maybe with horses in uh, the single race exotics? Or are you going to try to beat him? It's a difficult race to approach from a betting standpoint, at least for me, based on the opinions. Uh, you know, I wrote a piece on DRF.com where I made a fair value line for this race. And it's just the kind of race where I don't think that there's great value on any horse. Uh, and I do believe that Mage is the most likely winner. I think his chances of winning this race are probably north of 40%. So, I mean, if he's around seven to five, I guess that's a decent win price on him. Uh, we'll see what price he goes off at. I just think that he is a horse that, from a horizontal standpoint in a pick five sequence, I would definitely want to lean most heavily on him. I have trouble sort of without seeing the, the odds yet, uh, you know, saying a, a strategy that I'm going to go with in terms of vertical wagers. Maybe a horse like Red Route One, I could key underneath and exact as a trifecta because it does feel like he's going to be a solid price in this race, probably north of 10 to one. So if I could get him in there underneath and potentially beat horses like First Mission and National Treasure, maybe that's the way to go. But it's not a preakness that I was really itching to bet from a, a vertical wager standpoint. I'm not, uh, I know you're not a National Treasure fan, but I'd rather have National Treasure at a better price than First Mission. I'm going to try to fade First Mission in here just a little bit, not because I don't respect his ability, but because I think he's going to be way too short and he's still very, very inexperienced. Uh, I'm curious about National Treasure's tactics. I think they're going to be very aggressive with him. Whether he's good enough to beat Mage, I'm not sure. He's four to one on the line. And as you mentioned, that's a little bit light. I need him to drift a bit, but I think if there's someone to upset mage it might be national treasure with a trip where he gets the jump on him turning into the stretch let's kick off the pick five and in maryland the pick five is a pretty low takeout and as we know uh every penny counts 12 percent on the pick five uh at uh pimlico on saturday race number nine we end with mage we start with mages 
half sister. That's the number five gunning going out for Flavia Pratt and Kenny McPeak. And I talked to Kenny McPeak earlier this week, and he's very excited about running her, especially turning her back in a race full of speed. Yeah, I think that's the key point in this race. There does appear to be a lot of speed signed on. Uh, I mean, horses like the three, the five, the seven, and others, I mean, they have to go forward. That's their best chance. And, you know, while Gunning's not some deep closer, she's certainly showed more finishing ability than a lot of others in this field. And while her pedigree said that maybe going a mile last time should have worked out for her being that half-sister to Mage, it just felt like she didn't have the late punch that she had possessed in some of her sprint races. So the turn back is going to work for her, I believe. And I know she's not the fastest horse on speed figures, but I just think the race could potentially fall into her lap. So uh, I did think Gunning looked pretty formidable in this spot. Let's talk a bit about the morning line favorite. That's Begin. Did you think that was sort of a bad loss last time out in the Garland of Roses? I mean, she opened up a pretty big lead at the 316th pole and then got a little bit drifty in the stretch. I know the horses she was in against that day have come back to win. Uh, they're not superstars. Uh, now Begin's going to have to do this not only off of perhaps a bad loss, but off of a five-month layoff. Yeah, and, and we'll see if she runs here. She's actually also cross-entered at Saturday on Saturday at Belmont in an allowance race where I think I made her seven to five on the morning mm. line. So that might be an easier spot for her if they choose. And I mean, they already scratched her out of a tough spot at Aqueduct last week. So it feels like maybe they're searching for an easy race to bring her back off the little bit of a layoff. So we'll see if this is it. Um, yeah, she ran that big race too back at Aqueduct. The figure seems like it was a little high for that quality. And then last time, I mean, she got there. She, it seemed like she had it won. And Betsy Blue, who read her down, she's honest. Uh, but Begin does have that tendency to sort of shut down in the last eighth of a mile of her races. So given the pace scenario here, that's a bit of a concern. I'm the boss of me scored last time out at Oaklawn. To me, I think that track was a little bit speed friendly and I'm the boss of me was able to make hay when getting to the lead. It could be a completely different pace scenario here. It is worth noting that this barn did send up an Oaklawn invader to win on Preakness Week in a much lower level race a couple of years ago. Yeah, I think she's one of the most talented sprinters in this field. I mean, I wouldn't hold that third place finish behind Wicked Halo and Monterey against her too back when she got a gigantic time form US speed figure with a huge pace upgrade because the pace of that race was so fast. But she does feel like one of these horses that needs to be forwarded. That could be a difficult trip in this race. Let's talk a little bit about race number 10. This is the Jim McKay turf sprint. Uh, again, a race where there is a lot of speed in this race, but there might be one true speed of the speed because the number six, that's right, is an absolute blazer. Yeah, that's sort of how I'm viewing this race. I mean, that's right. It's just so sharp out of the gate. Um, even in races that have other speed, when he was in those last year, he would just seem to open up a length or two on those fields and really take everybody else off the bridle and behind. And sometimes when you have a horse like that in a race like this, it can really work against the other horses that want to be forward. And sometimes, sometimes even if the pace is fast, make it more likely that a horse like that's right can take them all the way. And he just seems like a true five furlong turf sprinter. I don't think he wants to go a step beyond that, but coming back off the layoff in this spot, it just seems like it really is the right race for him. Uh, he's 12 to one on the morning line. Personally, for me, I think that's great value if we can get it. Uh, we'll see how this race gets bet. But I was very interested in that's right, thinking that maybe he could, uh, you know, some of the other speeds that look just more talented than him, maybe he could put them in a difficult situation. I know trainer Mike Moore wanted to get a prep race into him, and he had him entered in Laurel. And of course, that was when Laurel was having all of their problems, and there was a track cancellation. The good news was he already had plan B in mind, that he was going to train him right up to the Jim McKay. He's had this race circled. He'd love to have a prep, but this has been his main early season goal. And that's right, of course, as speed. Are you worried about the morning line favorite's current form? Artemis City Limits, who ran some very fast races last year and will be getting Lasix for the first time since his most recent victory at Saratoga. He just seemed to be tailing off a little bit. What did you think of the Shaker Town last time? I know he was in against uh, Caravel, the best turf sprinter in the country. He just didn't really run his best race. Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't a good effort. And even when this horse has been in top form, he's never been the most reliable win candidate. He sometimes has that character trait where he's content to settle for minor awards. Uh, you know, 
I didn't necessarily view him as the horse to beat in this race, and maybe he will go favored. He does have Irad Ortiz aboard after all, and it seems like everything he rides goes favored. So uh, we'll see. I mean, nothing better who drew the rail. I kind of you know pegged him as the horse to beat in this race. Just a really solid runner who can go a variety of distances and shows up every time. Uh, I, I think he's the most likely winner here. Uh, but uh, you know, three to one, I don't know if that was great value on him in this uh, competitive field. Your opinion on Coppola, David, a horse that earned a gaudy buyer's speed figure last time out, albeit with what I thought was a perfect trip, where he sat the pocket, he got a seam in the two path, and he shot on through. He was really running in the stretch, putting daylight margin between himself and the runner up, and maybe he'll get the right pace set up. You're always worried about horses like this, however, that might just get run off their feet. Yeah, he's a horse that I think has a lot of talent. Uh, I mean, he showed it last time. I question whether he's a true five furlong turf sprinter. He just doesn't have that natural speed. And when you watch his two prior races at Gulfstream, he was really struggling to keep up in the early stages, didn't seem to like being out wide. And with that's right in the race, I just wonder he's going to get another one of those trips again. But he definitely has the talent to win a race like this if the trip works out. Let's move on to race number 11, the grade three Maryland sprint. Now this is at three quarters of a mile on the dirt. The morning line favorite in here is the number seven, Nakatomi going out for Wesley Ward. He's one of those late running sprinters that does have some ability. He's going to need some pace. And really the key for him is, will the number eight straight no chaser and the number 10 wonder where Craig is go out in battle mode and set things up. I like Nakatomi as a horse. I've never really loved him as a favorite in a race like this. He's just one of these horses that feels like he's always a shorter price than I believe he's supposed to be in his races. And sometimes he shows up. He usually runs pretty well. I, I just don't really view him as the horse to beat in here. And I went back and watched his Commonwealth and was just more disappointed than I even was watching it the first time because it just wasn't the strongest race overall. And he had dead aim on the leaders. It just seemed to hang all the way through the stretch. Maybe turning back to six furlongs will be better for him. Uh, there is more pace in this race. But at a short price like he usually is... It, I wanted to go elsewhere in here. Let's talk a little bit about a horse that just earned a gigantic buyer speed figure against weaker competition. That's the number eight, Straight No Chaser. They tried to run him in the Malibu against Taba last year. For some reason, they did not try to use his speed at all, and he was hung out wide, and he was still in the mix at about the eighth pole before being put away. Uh, he then ran third in the Palos Verdes, and last time out, they got him to the front, and he was very, very impressive. Is there a chance that he can make the lead and kind of shake clear of wonder where Craig is? I'm not sure about that. Uh, I mean, he does have plenty of natural speed, but there are other fast horses in here, like you said. And, you know, Brittany Russell has two horses with speed. You have to think they're going to ride one of them really aggressively. And I would imagine that is wonder where Craig is. Straight note chaser, he was very impressive last time. Um, if you look in Time Form US, that was a race with blue color coated yes. pace figures. I mean, it was just, you know, the, the Time Form US speed figure, not quite as impressive as the buyer be due to the pace downgrade, uh, just getting that perfect trip. So I wonder if he's a horse that might take a little too much money off that gaudy buyer last time uh but the talent is definitely there if the trip works out i just feel like he might be hounded by one or two of those runners drawn to his outside tell me a little bit about something about one of the jerry robb trained runners the number four al loves josie this was a horse earlier in his career that was a bit of a speed demon he has learned to rate in some of his recent starts and i think that versatility is going to serve him well uh he has shown a lot of ability in the past he's going to be a good price in this race and he just might work out a trip yeah, I typically wouldn't want to take a horse like this in a graded stakes on one of these uh, triple crown days, but just feels like this Maryland sprint didn't come up quite as tough as it could have. And there are horses with talent in here, but they all have something to prove. And Alex Josie, I mean, like you said, he got into really great form over the winter. I loved the visual of his victories two and three back, albeit against weaker. And then last time, he just got the total wrong trip. I mean, right. he was a little too far back in the early stages after a troubled start. He seemed like he had some horse at the top of the stretch, but just got badly sandwiched in between runners, lost all of his momentum, and then couldn't finish it off. But that was going seven furlongs, which is stretching him anyway. Um, I just think this is a much better spot for him. And if he can you know, relax behind the leaders and make that mid-race move, he could be interesting here at a price. And he should be a price in this race, to be sure, stepping up in class. But he has shown 
a lot of ability and he has grown up uh, mentally. He's a lot more handy and rateable and tactical. We'll move on to race number 12, the race preceding the Preakness. It's the James W. Murphy Stakes. We see Najirak is the favorite at 8-5 to five on the morning line. He's a deserving favorite based on his credentials, a graded stakes winner sprinting uh, last year. He's done nothing wrong since except he hasn't won. His last race, he was wired at Keeneland. He had his chance at the eighth pole and maybe Maybe he felt the effects of the layoff, but when you have a grand motion horse off a layoff, you usually just expect them to fire. I like Najirak as a horse. I don't want to take a short price on him. I won't be surprised when he wins. Yeah, he's definitely the horse to beat in this race. I mean, it just, you know, didn't come up even as tough as the Transylvania did. So it's arguably a slight drop in class for him. Um, still, though, I know his buyers and speed figures in general just say he's better going two turns. I don't quite buy into that. I just don't see him finishing these races as strongly as you'd want to see. He's gotten some pretty good trips and, you know, just doesn't quite seal the deal at the end, albeit against some tough fields. Uh, so at a short price, I didn't necessarily love him in here. And I also wasn't a big fan of the other horse that was a short price on the line. Uh, Fantastic again, who... I don't have a whole lot of confidence that he's a turf horse. Uh, he's run his best races on the dirt and synth, and I don't know that he's quite so versatile that he can transfer it back to the turf. So uh, I viewed this race as one where I would want to shop for some prices. I think you're absolutely right on both points. I'm very concerned about distance for Najirak, who I think could be a very nice sprinter down the road. Six, seven at Belmont, who work very, very well for him, I would think. Fantastic, again, of course, is going to take money because he ran third in the Jeff Ruby Stakes. And people are going to note that two fills won that race and came back to run well in the Kentucky Derby. But as, uh, but as David mentioned, that race was on the all-weather. Now, Fantastic, again, will have to utilize that speed on turf. I want to talk about the number six Moonstrike a little bit. Jose Ortiz takes the mound in here. Now, this horse made his turf debut in an allowance at Keeneland last time out. And when you download your free formulator pass performances for the Preakness on the Race of the Day event page at drf.com, you click on the short comment and you watch the trip. It wasn't the best. No, it definitely wasn't. And, you know, this horse is 20 to 1 on the line. We'll see if he actually is that price with Jose Ortiz getting aboard. Like we said, he does have sort of that live look to him. But uh, speaking of that trip last time, I mean, he did save ground most of the way. So that was a positive. But you could see coming to the quarter pole, uh, Corey Lannery, who was riding him that day, had a ton of horse underneath him and just needed to find some place to put him to a clear path to run. And he couldn't do it. He tried to dive down to the rail at about the eighth pole and just got completely sawed off in traffic, basically just had to you know you know snatch this horse up for the final eighth of a mile of the race so i don't know if he would have won that day but it felt watching that race like he might have been right there at the end um we'll see if that's good enough to make him a player in here he just looks uncompetitive on paper and based on that last turf race he might be a lot better on grass than he was on the synth and uh the fact that they're taking a shot in here i think the connections also want to find out if he might be as good as that last run suggested that he could be and I think they found the right spot to learn because this is the kind of horse that has found a field where maybe the two favorites are questionable and he has all of the upside. Any opinion on the horses trying turf for the first time? Usually they're not my cup of tea in races like this. Top recruit doesn't have a ton of turf pedigree. He has a ton of stamina pedigree. I think his dam is a half to a fleet again who won the Breeders' Cup Marathon. And then you have Circling the Drain who has a little bit more pedigree on the bottom uh, out of a Cozy and Mare that did well on grass. Yeah, Top Recruit ran so well in that stakes race at Ellis Park last year, and he's just kind of trying to find that form again, and maybe the surface switch will uh, bring it out of it. And I do like Midshipman as a turf sire. Um, you know, between the two, the one that I feel confident is going to like the turf is the five circling the drain just has big turf pedigree on the dam side the west coasts have been okay on the turf so far but watching this horse run he's just got that long loping stride that i look for when horses are going to transfer to the turf so i have confidence that circling the drain is going to move up on this surface he's just a little bit of a plotter so we'll see if the the way that the pace uh, shakes out works for him but i think he's gonna like the grass you and I'll talk about all of the undercard races when we write our betting strategies preview available a little bit later in the week on DRF.com. But I am interested in your thoughts on one horse on the undercard, Tequilera, a horse that had shown speed um, earlier in her career and last time out received 
kind of a questionable ride and trip where they didn't use her speed and she wound up five wide throughout and she was still in the thick of things turning for home. There's a case to be made, barring the fact that that Brittany Russell Australian invader seems to have a little bit of speed, that this time Tequilera will go to the front. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say before I get to your question that uh, you know, I'm excited to write the betting strategy with you. I mean, we started working on it already, but I mean, I, I kind of went into this Freakness card, you know, a little down on the quality of some of the races when I saw the overnight. But as I went through and handicapped it, I think there are a lot of price opportunities throughout the day at Pimlico on Saturdays. And this is another race uh, that you bring up where I think that there are some interesting ways to go. In Tequilera, I, I do view her as the horse to beat in that race, like you said weird ride last time she has so much natural speed they didn't go forward with her and she just was hung out to dry around both turns uh she ran really well that day and i think she is very much the horse to beat in that race but that's one of a few wide open races on this undercard that i think you can make cases for a variety of horses you're absolutely right. There's a nice maiden special weight on the turf as well with some horses that have shown some ability, horses with big price tags, maybe an opportunity for a price or two as well. So check out the betting strategies if you have some time later this weekend. Let's get to some questions. Thank you so much, by the way, for uh, submitting your questions via social media. Uh, we'd love to answer them right now. Our first question is, what, are the key, what is the key for Mage to win the race? It's getting out of the gate, right? I think it's getting out of the gate and uh, being able to make that move when Javier Castellano wants to move. Uh, he, he does. You don't want to have a horse like this move too soon or uh, get caught in traffic, maybe like Epicenter did last year. So you, know, you want to see the trip work out for Mage after that expected slow start. Yes, the, the start and whether he can make the move is the key for Mage, way the horse to beat in the Preakness. How much attention should be paid to track bias leading up to the Preakness, say on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday prior to the Preakness? Always important, right, Dave? Yeah, I mean, especially the early races on Saturday when you get a better gauge of how the track is playing that day. I mean, sometimes, you know, from day to day, the tracks can change a lot on these big days, uh, you know, the weekends of races like the Derby, the, the Preakness, the Belmont. Uh, but uh, you might be able to speak better than I can to how the track at Pimlico usually plays. Uh, but I would pay attention to some of the early dirt races on Saturday. It's been playing fair so far, I think, this meeting. But at Pimlico, you always are worried that maybe speed will show up on these days. So David's absolutely right. Keep an eye on the early part of these races, but don't get obsessed with track bias. If two favorites win on the lead and the first two races on the card on dirt, don't automatically assume that there's going to be a track bias. Look for some sort of wacky things to happen. If a 50 to one shot is on the lead, maybe takes them all the way down to the wire and gets pipped and then or maybe you start thinking uh, that there's some sort of a bias. Next question, which horses move up or down if wet weather moves in? What I like about Formulator is if you click on the sire's name, you get all kinds of cool stats. Yeah, I mean, you could see the wet track statistics for all of the sires in this race. You can look at the female family and if the dam has produced any wet track progeny. I mean, in this day and age, the horses are generally lightly raced, and we don't see too many that have prior wet track form even coming into the Triple Crown races. I mean, a few horses have tried it. Coffee with Chris has a number of starts on wet tracks. None of them have been great, but it feels like he's you know gotten better since then. The, the horse that I guess you would point to is Red Route 1, who does have a couple of big second-place finishes over wet track, so he certainly wouldn't be hurt if it comes up wet on Saturday. What would you make of Blazing Sevens, who ran kind of a blah third in the hopeful over a wet track and then seemed to appreciate it a little bit more in the champagne? Just in general, I'm not a big wet track handicapper. I mean, a wet track at Saratoga when there's a downpour right. can be very different to a sealed track at Aqueduct or Belmont. I mean, they can play so differently. And you want to, I think what you really do want to pay attention to is was there a track bias? on the wet track that these horses ran over previously because that can often play into results. Sometimes we see very speed favoring wet tracks. Um, so I'd pay attention to that stuff, but as far as whether or not they're gonna handle it on Saturday at Pimlico, if there is a wet track even, I'm not worrying too much about it personally. Now, when you take your peek at Timeform US PPs, there's bias information, color-coded blue and red for closers and speed. So that could help as well. Let's move on to our next question. Which horse 10 to one or higher on the morning line do you like to be in the number? And which horse lower than five to one would you be willing to leave out? I think Red Route 1 at 10 to one or, or higher is, is who you're leaning on. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, if I had to say a horse that I think is going to be in the money among those larger prices, I think it's Red Rue One is the horse that I would definitely point to that I have the most confidence in. And for me, you know, a short price that I'd be worried about just is national treasure. Yeah. And I, you know, I totally get the positive take on him. He's to me, he's kind of an all or nothing type in this race. You know, maybe he gets brave on the front or maybe just his, you know, the, the, the tendency we've seen for him to kind of shut down in the far turns, maybe that gets worse in this race. Uh, but uh, if I was going to take a stand against the horse, it would be him. Uh, Red Route 1 would be my 10 to 1 or higher horse. And again, I'm going to try to fade the horse on the outside while I respect his ability. I want to see First Mission do it against this level of competition, stretching all the way out to a mile and three sixteenths. How would you assess National Treasure's workout since returning to the Baffert barn in comparison to how he was working for Yachtin and during his initial stint with Baffert? It seems Baffert always works him fast. Yeah, I mean, I've been watching a lot of these uh, West Coast workouts, which we can have access to on XBTV. And um, National Tra I mean, yeah, Baffert always works his horses hard. It seems like uh, he's really been pushing this horse in the morning to get extremely fit for this race, maybe more so than Yachtin was prior to the Santa Anita Derby, where, you know, the rider wasn't asking him for quite as much, even though National Treasure is just naturally a really strong workhorse. You can watch all of his workouts going back to last year, and he just shows up in the morning and lays down these fast times uh you know without being pressed too hard but it feels like especially leading up to this race they're tightening the screws and we'll see if that works out and uh maybe it's also a sign that's going to try to use a little bit more speed pushing on them and working them fast in the morning breaking from the inside with blinkers on in recent preakness stakes has the winner been sitting off of the pace i know you've done your research on this yeah, I mean, I remember I got, got a question a couple of years ago about, you know, whether closers are better in the Belmont or speed better in the Belmont and the same thing in the Preakness. And I think I looked up the last 15 years of Preakness winners and just sort of, you know, analyzed their early positions. And I came up with the answer that both races play pretty fair. I mean, it just depends on the pace situation. But, you know, when I kind of averaged it out, you know, the early positions of the winners of the Preakness and the Belmont have actually been pretty similar over the past several years. I know people have their ideas about which running styles you want in each race, but I think each race is an individual and you have to kind of analyze the pace situation as it comes to you. I think that's very, very well said. It's all about the pace situation, in my opinion, if you're looking at this year's Preakness stakes. A lot of horses get intimidated on the rail. That is true. First Mission had Arabian Lion bearing down on him in the Lexington. How impressive was First Mission battling to win that one? I mean, I think that I wouldn't say he faced adversity coming through on the rail. There was a wide gap at the top of the stretch when Arabian Lion had drifted wide off the far turn. And he did come back down to the inside to make it a little tight on first mission late. But first mission had already come through the hole at that point. So it was sort of some belated hurting. Um, so I thought first mission all in all got a pretty good trip. And if first mission isn't up to the task in this race, I'm not viewing the trip as being what does him in. I tend to agree. It looked like they want the jockey on Arabian line wanted first mission to come up the rail so he could play a little herding game in mid stretch. And first mission is just simply a better horse than Arabian lion. Another question, or are we in good shape? Is there a particular running style that's traditionally better than the pregnant stakes? I think we handled that one though. Yeah, I think it's uh, it generally plays pretty fairly. I, like we said, pay attention to track bias, pay attention to how this race is going to shape up from a pace standpoint. But I'm not you know, coming into this preakness looking for one specific running style. And that is our last question and all we have time for. David, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you are swamped this week for Preakness Week and, of course, doing your normal duties on the New York racing circuit. Uh, I had a lot of fun. Yeah, I did too. And this is always the good kind of busy on weeks like this because there's a lot to be excited about. And uh, doing this content, it's always a pleasure. Check out our betting strategies if you have a chance on drf.com. It'll be posted tomorrow, I believe, uh, Friday. And of course, check out David's uh, great work on DRF TV on the Daily Racing Forum YouTube channel. He and Craig Milkowski do stellar stakes previews and their podcasts must listen to programs each and every week. Thanks so much for joining us on the DRF Preakness Stakes webinar 2023 and best of luck on Saturday. Master Horse Racing with Daily Racing Forms Formulator. Now free for DRF Bets members. Sign up to get the best bonus in racing with a $250 deposit match plus a $10 free bet and free Formulator Master Performances. Go to drf.com slash bet.